Mr. McCoy here with 11, part 13. Oh, Sam, Max said. Sam was crying now, but whatever had filled his chest began to melt, to seep away with the tears, like sap from a tree. It was your voice shouting. When? At the children's home, banging doors, one after the other. I was so angry, Max said, in a rage. That woman, how can I ever tell you? How can I explain? When your mother died, no one knew where I was, so a neighbor took you to the home. But then they found me. He ran his hand over his face. Shocking. The packet that came in the mail, a loving note from Julia written just before she died, and legal papers giving me the right to take care of you, to raise you. It was quiet for a moment. I'd missed you. Thought about you. Thought about you both all the time. Sam wiped his face with a sleeve. It was all right. It was going to be all right. I came up on the boat to get you. I never stopped, never slept. You'd been in the home for almost a month, and that night the woman wouldn't let me have you. I'm tired, she said. Come back tomorrow. I waved the court papers in front of her. I said you weren't going to stay there one more night, one more hour. Legal, legal or not, you'll wait until tomorrow. He's in bed, and that's where I'm going soon. I'm not letting any child ready now. I'm not getting any child ready now. I've done my work for the day. Sam pictured her face. She had lines across her forehead, and her hair was flat against her head. That terrible place. Mac raised his hand to his chest. I can't tell you how angry I felt. That's something inside. I took the stairs two at a time. I opened one door after another. You called. You shouted. I wrapped you in a sweater and scooped you up in my arms and the boat and went down the stairs. Night cat, you said. Sam nodded, remembering the stairs, tilting, his arms out, wanting the cat. The woman blocked the way into the kitchen where Julia's cat was cowering under the table. Blocked the way until she saw my face. They sat back, the flames crackling in the great room of the castle. Max's eyes were closed. He seemed out of breath. I took you to the boat, Max said. I remember the sound of foghorns, Sam said. I was too angry to think straight or I wouldn't have taken you out in the storm. We went on to the rocks. The hull split and the boat went under. All of it. We were in the water and I reached out for you and the cat. Somehow, you held on to the little boat I'd made. Max's mouth was unsteady. I nearly lost you the second time. They went outside then, Sam feeling the wonder of it. They watched the moat below them, the boathouse across the way, swirls of mist. We took a train then to Angie and Anima, Max said. Both of us were soaked, the cat shivering. There was a nurse who sat nearby and bandaged my leg. I never thought what people would think. And then I carried you the last mile, and they were waiting. And you were safe. Safe. I told myself I'd never go near the water again, Max said. I'd never have a boat again. He smiled at Sam. The next day we heard about the newspaper report. He shook his head. Angie and I went back to let them know we were alive. What Sam was feeling was a burst of happiness. He and Mac belonged together. Julia was his mother, Lydia his grandmother. He realized what Mac had said, never have a boat again. He put his hand on Mac's sleeve. Don't say that. Let's build a boat, the two of us, together. So do you think Mac will like that idea, Sam and Mac building a boat together? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. In the morning, Sam still awoke before it was light. Go back to sleep, he told himself, yawning. The castle was finished after all. He closed his eyes, but there was one more thing he might do for Caroline, even if she never knew it. He nudged Nightcat lightly with his foot. The cat climbed over him and jumped off the bed to wait at the bedroom door. 
Sam went downstairs, into the kitchen, and shredded a little leftover chicken for the cat and took a roll for himself. He still thought of Caroline. If only he could tell her the whole story. In front of the castle, he plugged in the small cutters, listening to their buzz, and cut a rectangle into the front of the castle. Over the curved doors, enough glass was left for one more window. He smoothed the edges of the opening, fit the glass into it, and framed it by gluing on small pieces of wood. He stepped back. The medieval lady was visible now. She stood in the tangerine room, looking out, making friends with the world instead of hiding, he told Caroline in his mind. He stood there, looking at the castle, satisfied. It could go upstairs now, maybe with the little boat on his dresser. Mac was at the door. Isn't today the school party? Peas porridge hot, trenchers, cloves and cinnamon. The medieval fest, Sam shrugged. The medieval feast. I'll drive you in the truck, Sam. You won't be able to carry the castle? I'm not going to bring it. But why? Sam shook his head. He'd really made the castle for Caroline and for himself. Mac glanced at the castle. I always thought it was a shame that Bolt never finished his castle, that for years it just crumbled away. It isn't like that. I finished it, all of it. Mac touched the small green book on the corner of the table. Caroline wrote it down about your building it, didn't she? And shouldn't everyone know about it? Mac went to the door, tapping on the frame. I'm going to scramble some eggs, not as good as Angie's, but still. He reached out. Take the castle to school today, Sam. You'll be glad afterward. How could Sam say no to Mac? He ripped out the back pages of the notebook, the section that belonged just to him, and took them up to his bedroom. After breakfast, they left for school a little late because it had taken so long to wrap the castle and put it in the back of the truck. Want me to come inside? Mac asked as they unloaded it at the side door, but Mac shook his head. Without thinking, he reached out to hug Mac. He carried the castle down the hall alone, maneuvering his way around kids who were carrying cans of water for plants, kids who quick-stepped instead of running because Mr. Ramon might be lurking around the stairs. In the classroom, Sam put the castle, still covered, on the table under the window. The room was noisier than usual. Five kids were getting ready to do their play, and Eric marched back and forth with a sword and a paper helmet that, Sam, that made Sam laugh. In the corner, Marcy practiced her oral report, her lips moving, her arms waving. Stacked on the table were the large round pieces of bread with the center scooped out. The trenchers Mrs. Stanick had promised she'd make. She'd actually brought in a huge pot of mashed peas to put on the bread, although Sam couldn't imagine anyone eating any of it. Marcy's mother had brought apple juice with cloves and Eric's mom had made cinnamon cake, all food that had been around in the Middle Ages. Mrs. Stanick turned and saw him. You finished the castle, she said, as if she'd known all along it would happen. He stood there, embarrassed, not knowing what to do with his hands. Show us, she said. He unwrapped the castle slowly, setting Caroline's horse straighter on the base, feeling the heat in his face. Mrs. Stanick moved away from the board and came to the table, her hand to her mouth. Oh, Sam, she touched the small knight standing in front of the towers and bent over to see the medieval lady standing in the window. It's Caroline, isn't it? Her mother made them, and Caroline made the horse, he said. It's all here in her notebook. Hey, look at what Sam did, Marcy said, and then everyone was crowding in to look at the castle, looking at him. Cool, someone said, and Sam built this? Someone else said. Eric grinned at him. Grinned at him. Terrific, Mackenzie. Really terrific. Sam couldn't stop grinning back at Eric. 
and at the rest of them. Mac had been right. Sam went back to his seat, glad that he'd brought the castle. More than glad. Marcy began her speech, talking about cities with walls built around them for protection. And Mrs. Stanick walked around the room, passing out her trenchers, holding out the pot of peas. Sam took a trencher. I'll try the peas. He'd probably be the only one, after all. Anima made something delicious with chickpeas. How different could this be? Besides, Mrs. Stanick's face was red. For the first time, he thought about how hard she tried. The peas were terrible with enough pepper to make him sneeze, but he didn't have time to think about it because the classroom door banged open and Marcy stopped speaking, one arm raised. So who do you think is at the door? I bet you you can guess. Share with your fellow listener. Caroline stood there, her bracelet circling halfway up her arm. She was wearing a purple hat that curled around her face. And if no one else were in the room, as if no one else were in the room, she smiled at Sam and said, Here I am, Sam I am. The dismissal bell rang. Sam zigzagged around down the hall, carrying one end of the castle. Those trenchers, ugh. Caroline zigzagged behind him with the other. I'll tell Mom it was worth that two-hour drive this morning just to taste those peas. Yum, she laughed. They laughed. Sam backed down the three outside steps, trying to hold the castle level. Easy, Caroline said, and then, so what about Sam Bell? It was my parents' name. He bent to pick up a knight that had slid off the edge of the castle but Mac thought it would be easier for me to have his. They reached the van, and Caroline's mother popped the rear door from the driver's seat. You're sure it's all right? Caroline asked. Sam grinned at her. About my name? About the castle? Sure. One thing, I know why you put the window in my room in the castle. He waited. You want me to look for friends, don't you? Just go to the classroom door. Just pick out a kid and smile. You have a great smile. You'll see. He slid the castle into the rear of the van. Oh, Sam, she said. I will. I'll never forget. She did smile then. Thanks, but one more thing. How can we stay friends if you don't email, if you don't write? She put a crumpled piece of paper in his hand. My email address. She leaned forward, purple hat, a dozen bracelets, a constellation of freckles, and kissed his cheek before she went around to the front of the van. Think about it. Write to me. I'll figure it out. Say yes. He stepped back to stand at the curb, his hand raised to his face, watching until they pulled away and turned the corner. He went back into school and down the stairs to the resource room. Mrs. Waring was at the window watering her plants. I have to read, he said. Sam? She brushed a drop of water off a leaf. I saw your castle at lunchtime. Everyone's talking about it, and no wonder. It's amazing. Thanks, but listen, I don't have to be a great reader. I just have to get by. Her head was tilted, the watering can dripping. How could he tell her the whole story, the papers in the attic, the computer, Caroline, all of it? What a difference it would have made if he could read. He settled for telling her just about the boat. My grandfather and I are going to build a sailboat. I want to write it down. What do we do, and how do we do it? How much time did you spend thinking about that castle? How much time working on it? He knew what she was thinking every minute I had. That's what it takes sometimes. She put the watering can down and wiped her fingers on her jeans, then lifted the pot off the sea and traced it with her finger. How about giving me a couple of afternoons every week after school, a couple of mornings for part of the summer? We'll keep at it, work at it, we'll really try. She held out her hand. Give me a chance, Sam. I love to teach you the way you love to build. She had such a nice smile, her teeth a little crooked, her dark eyes soft. All right, he could do that. 
He swept his hand around the room, and sometime soon, I'll make shelves for this room. He'd missed the bus again, but that was all right, too. It was warm out, almost summer, so he jogged part of the way. Mac was outside waiting for him. They walked out back to stand in the doorway of the shed. Piles of sweet-smelling wooden planks stretched from one end to the other, and boxes of screws and nails were stacked against the wall. Mac had begun the cradle that would hold the growing hull of the boat. They breathed in the sweetness of the wood, halfway listening to the music that was coming from Anima's restaurant. Sam flexed his fingers. He couldn't wait to begin, but Anji poked his head out the window. Plenty of time for that. First, how about some muffins, you guys, and a glass of milk? Put some meat on those bones. We're built that way in our family, Max said. Thin but tough. Right, Sam said. They opened the back door of the deli. Just a second, Sam said. He went into Anji's office to get to the internet and smoothed out the paper with Caroline's address. He wanted to be sure she'd get the first message as soon as she reached home. One thing. One word. Yes. There's a little more, but right now, share what your opinion is of 11. Go for it. So, 11. It could be anything. A street, a house number, a pair of chimneys that didn't frighten him anymore. His 11th birthday. The year he met his best friend. It might even be the double masts on the boat that he'd sailed every summer on the St. Lawrence, with all of them, Mac, Anji, Anima, and Caroline. It was the year he began to read. That marks the end of 11. The next saga we get to plunge into is truly haunting. Be prepared, it's coming.